tonight, a massive operation underway. Crews prepare to clear the collapsed bridge in Baltimore. The meticulous task of a major mission. To figure out how we can cut it up into the pieces we need to be able to lift. A fleet of cranes, tugboats and barges brought in for support. Ukrainians arrive before emergency visa deadline. It has been tremendously helpful for those who lost everything in Ukraine. The final rush to flee war and come to Canada. Plus, what it takes to launch legal action against social media giants. We are in unprecedented territory here. Accusations of addiction hard to prove in court. National News with Heather Butts. Good evening. A delicate and difficult job now getting underway at the site of the bridge disaster in Baltimore. Officials today outlining a lengthy and dangerous process as crews arrive at the site of the wreckage to clear bridge debris and the massive ship that crashed into it. CTV's Tony Grace on the first steps of a monumental task. From the surface today, a stunning new look at the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge and the cargo ship Dally that hit it. To go out there and to see it up close, you realize just how daunting a task this is. Heavy cranes now setting up to move millions of pounds of metal and the ship itself. A complicated task engineers are still meticulously mapping out. To figure out how we can cut it up into the pieces we need to be able to lift. This crane that we're looking at is massive. The thing we also know is this, so is the challenge ahead of us. The operation will involve seven floating cranes, 10 tugboats, nine barges, eight salvage vessels and five Coast Guard ships. To do this safely, you have to really figure out where, when you take a piece away, how the bridge is going to react or the breeze is going to react. Painstaking work to reopen a route that handles billions of dollars in annual shipments and employs thousands. We come with heavy hearts. And to find the bodies of four more of the six construction workers believed to have died, all of whom were honored today. Those six men that were working at one in the morning when most of us were asleep to take care of the roads for us. The National Transportation Safety Board expects to have its preliminary findings about the crash and collapse before the end of April. Those working on the recovery are pleading for patience. I know right now everyone wants to see things moving. You need to know, you need to trust that behind the scenes it's moving. U.S. President Joe Biden said today he's going to visit Baltimore next week for a first-hand look at the beginning of a recovery and rebuilding plan that Maryland's governor now says he cannot measure in days, weeks, or even months. Heather. Tony, thank you. To the war in Gaza now, the United Nations top court is ordering Israel to open more land crossings to get aid into the besieged enclave, where more than two million people are at severe levels of food insecurity. CTV's Jeremy Sharon reports. A desperate rush, scrambling for airdropped aid. Ahmed Tafish spends his days looking up searching to secure food for his family. If we can at least get a can of beans or hummus to support ourselves, we hope that we will eat today, he says. That goal achieved two small bags of food, enough to celebrate. <laughs> but it's this kind of desperation humanitarian organizations are warning about. Children are visibly hungry and malnourished. They have to search the streets for food and assistance, which is not coming fast enough. A new ruling from the UN's top court says Israel must take action without delay to allow more food and other aid in, including opening more land crossings. <laughs> it was a courageous and good decision by the court, says this Palestinian, but will Israel abide by the ruling, he asks. The U.S. Department of State says famine may already be present in parts of the enclave. Through the deliberate restrictions and denial of aid, Israel is using starvation as a method of warfare, which is prohibited. Some experts suggest the court's order hasn't addressed some other key concerns. Humanitarian assistance goes into Gaza, falls into the hands of Hamas, 
who distribute it to their own loyalists and people they're trying to recruit to support them are quite cynically exploiting the, uh, the, the situation of near famine for their own ends. Israel has in the past raised concerns about aid getting into the wrong hands and had urged the court not to issue any new orders, claiming that it placed no limits on aid entering the enclave. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said today Israel will return to the table with Hamas for ceasefire talks and a deal to release hostages. The two sides have failed to find a solution in recent attempts. Heather? Jeremy, thank you. Nine people have been detained in Tajikistan, suspected of having links to the mass shooting at a Russian concert hall. The four suspected gunmen behind the attack that killed 144 people are Tajik nationals. A faction of the Islamic State group has claimed responsibility. Russian investigators claim the gunmen are linked to Ukrainian nationalists. Kyiv has strongly denied any involvement. Ukrainians fleeing war are rushing to land in Canada. The deadline to enter under a special emergency visa is Easter Sunday. The program has seen tens of thousands of immigrants enter through the expedited process. CTV Sarah Plowman with one family who just arrived. They packed their lives into a few suitcases. Pieces of home of Ukraine were priority. Alessia Morozova's family landed in Fredericton last week just before a window closes. Sunday is the last day for Ukrainians approved on an emergency visa to arrive in Canada. This mother of two is relieved. She feels no boundaries for freedom and the ability to become independent and free here. From March 2022 until the end of February, nearly a million Ukrainians were approved under this three-year visa. Nearly 250,000 arrived, about 25%. It's unknown how many people arrived this month. Uh, I don't have the exact week over week numbers, but I've heard from the people who are working at the airports that the numbers have gone up. It's also unclear how many Ukrainians who've come have stayed. It is a multi-entry visa also, though, so people are allowed to come and go. Uh, so people have gone to get their parents out or gone to check on property. When hundreds of thousands of people come to Canada, experiences vary. Some face challenges like housing, work and language. And this opportunity to have at least two weeks stay at the hotel helped a lot. Morozova is grateful to Canada and the help she and her husband have received, but she wants independence and believes that's up to her. According to Ottawa, Ukrainians approved for the visa who arrive Monday or later have to meet general requirements to enter the country and those supports attached to the visa go away. The Ukrainian Canadian Congress tells me that means no more two week hotel stay paid for by the government or a one time grant. Heather. Sarah Plowman in Fredericton. Concerns over safety has more than 50% of Canadians supporting a ban on social media app TikTok, according to a new Leger poll. The survey comes after the U.S. passed a bill aiming to ban the app because of security concerns relating to its Chinese parent company. Canada has also ordered its own national security review. The idea of a ban is less popular among younger Canadians who are more likely to use TikTok. The popularity of social media platforms among young people led to a first-of-its-kind lawsuit in Canada this week. Four major Ontario school boards suing tech giants Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat and TikTok for more than $4 billion. There is doubt these lawsuits stand a chance, but if successful, they could have legal implications worldwide. CTV's Kamal Karmali reports. Four of Canada's biggest school districts taking on social media giants in court after claims the companies prioritize profits over students' mental health. That habitual checking has actually been associated with specific changes in brain regions involved in fear and anxiety. For many, it's the wrong move. The results just aren't there. I don't know if a lawsuit is actually going to solve that. Because it's something... We're essentially exploring new legal territory here. That's never been successfully done before. The problem here is that the plaintiffs are bringing forward lawsuits in a context where there are no 
tech-centric laws on the books, which means they face a significantly more uphill battle. It was just over a year ago we saw a school district in Seattle take on social media companies in a legal battle for the first time ever. Felicia Crake is part of their legal team. Their case opened the floodgates. She says there are now more than 750 school districts across the U.S. on board. We certainly were surprised about the you know amount of press and the way it really resonated with people around the country. But just like in Canada, there's limited legal precedent to lean on in the U.S. They're now relying on past lawsuits against other addictive products to support their cases. Public nuisance claims have been successfully used to address serious public health crises in America, both in the youth vaping litigation, as well as uh, against the opioid manufacturers. Whatever the outcome, it's certain this will set a new precedent for similar legal cases against social media companies moving forward. The decisions for the first few U.S.-based lawsuits set to come down in June, with Canadian lawmakers sure to be watching closely. Heather. All right, Kamal, thank you. A state of emergency has been declared in Ontario's Niagara region ahead of the upcoming total solar eclipse. Niagara Falls was declared by National Geographic to be one of the best places to see it. More than a million visitors are expected in the area April 8th. The region says it's making the declaration out of, quote, an abundance of caution, saying it will strengthen the tools it has to keep the community and infrastructure safe. Salmon farming in British Columbia has raised issues unique to the coast and has multiple stakeholders with cultural, economic and environmental interests. And now a Hollywood star is shining a light on the controversial practice. CTV's Abigail Turner explains. Salmon fish farms have long been a point of contention between environmentalists and farmers, but now a much bigger net is being cast on the topic. An Instagram post made by Oscar-winning actor and environmentalist Leonardo DiCaprio is calling out the Canadian government for what he claims it is considering, extending the licenses for open net pen salmon farms in British Columbia by up to six years. Many First Nations want the practice to be phased out over concerns about diseases like C lice spilling over from the farms potentially affecting the wild salmon population. We need as many Canadians to understand what's at stake right now. And if someone like Leonardo DiCaprio can assist us in that, very, very welcome, of course. DiCaprio's post gave this First Nations group thousands of new followers in just 24 hours. But the Canadian government is pushing back on DiCaprio's claims, saying in a statement to CTV News, quote, it remains committed to working on a responsible plan to transition from open net pen salmon farming by 2025. CTV News obtained a copy of a document sent to local municipalities that says, quote, at this time, the department is consulting on a license duration of between two and six years. Certainly this is not going to enhance the consultation that's going on on the transition planning. It's going to undermine it. But DiCaprio's post is being called irresponsible by one local salmon farmer group. Our companies would love to invite Mr. Di DiCaprio to come up to Canada and actually see for himself on the ground rather than making uh, baseless claims over his giant platform. The group also says not all First Nation groups are opposed to keeping open net pen salmon farms. He's never met any of the uh, Indigenous communities that uh, we support and employ uh, and who have environmental stewardship over our salmon farms. So it's really quite disappointing. The Minister of Fisheries and Oceans says it continues to work with both stakeholders and Indigenous communities about the next steps in what it's calling an important file. Abigail Turner, CTV News, Vancouver. To some sad news from Hollywood now, Louis Gossett Jr., the first black man to win the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, has died at the age of 87. Now, I'm busy. Now, Howard, sir, I request permission. Left, right or left, right or left, right or left, sir. This officer left. candidate requests permission to see you in private, sir. Now, I'm busy, and so are you. Now, you're cleaned up. Gossett won the Academy Award for his sergeant's role in An Officer and a Gentleman. Other accolades include an Emmy for his performance in the blockbuster miniseries Roots. He used his fame to fight racism and hunger. Family have not revealed a cause of death. Coming up, the bitter cost of chocolate. Doubling, tripling, quadrupling. 
the researchers trying to bring the price back down. Plus, all eyes on the court, the big names to watch at the Sweet 16. College basketball's famed March Madness Tournament is living up to its name with thrilling finishes and unpredictable outcomes. Gardner into beers, perfectly executed. Teams are picking up steam with both the men's and women's down to the final 16 on each side. With more on the big event and big names at the tournament, we're joined by TSN's Claire Hanna. Who are you keeping an eye on? Well, Heather, two of the most anticipated teams at this Albany Super Regional are both in action on Saturday, and that's the Iowa Hawkeyes and the LSU Tigers. But they're on different sides of the bracket in the Sweet 16. And we have to start by talking about the Iowa Hawkeyes because they have Caitlin Clark, who has been probably the most transformative and electrifying player ever in women's college basketball. Earlier this season, she broke the record for all-time scoring in either men or women's college basketball. And in this tournament she set the single season record for scoring now they're taking on the number five seed Colorado it's actually a rematch of last year's sweet 16 that saw Iowa advance to the elite eight now on the other side of the bracket the LSU Tigers are the number three seed and they're taking on the UCLA Bruins the number two seed and that's a really interesting matchup because LSU are the defending national champions I'm sure you've heard of their coach Kim Mulkey, she's a polarizing figure. And then one of their star players is Angel Reese, who was last year named the MVP, the most outstanding player of this March Madness tournament. Now, a lot of people are looking ahead to the Elite Eight already because if Iowa wins the Sweet 16 and LSU wins the Sweet 16, they'll face off in the Elite Eight. And that would be a rematch of last year's national championship final which saw LSU beat Iowa. There was no shortage of drama in that. So, Heather, that's definitely going to be the two games we're watching tomorrow with the anticipation that they might meet up on Monday. Exciting times. Claire, thank you. Still ahead, addressing the soaring cost of cocoa, the methods to help make chocolate more affordable. Concerns over his frail condition prompted Pope Francis to skip the traditional Good Friday procession at Rome's Colosseum, a first in his 11-year papacy. Earlier, the Pope appeared for a solemn Good Friday service at St. Peter's Basilica and remained seated throughout. In what is typically a very demanding week, the Vatican says he is trying to preserve his health for Easter Sunday. Parishioners across Canada took part in the Way of the Cross, a key holy ceremony for Catholics. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. In Winnipeg, hundreds gathered for the special outdoor service, while in Calgary, Christians braved snowy conditions. In Ottawa, the procession stopped for prayer at places of religious and cultural significance. As many prepare to celebrate with Easter egg hunts, one held outside of Calgary wasn't just for kids. Three, two, one, hunt! Hundreds of colorful dog treat filled eggs were hidden for the National Service Dog Easter Egg Hunt. The annual event is held in cities across the country and acts as a fundraiser for the organization. Well, you may have adjusted your spending on traditional Easter treats this year due to the soaring cost of chocolate. That has researchers at the University of Guelph developing ways to help keep chocolate prices in check. CTV Spencer Turcott reports. It's an untraditional way of making chocolate. At the University of Guelph, they've traded in the white hat for a white lab coat. Researchers have noticed the cost of chocolate isn't nearly as sweet as it tastes. Uh, nowadays, many people uh, would prefer to invest uh, on cocoa butter instead of Bitcoin. Long-term shortages of cocoa beans in West Africa paired with extreme weather is leading to crop failures and driving up the price. And the price is doubling, tripling, quadrupling. Some people say even will go five times higher than um, before all of this was happening. But this team believes they've developed methods to keep the cost of creating chocolate down. 
One way is using a fraction of shea butter and a fraction of palm oil. And not only mixing these two fractions together, but changing them with the use of enzymes, so it's a natural process, so that the final product really behaves, looks, and, and, and gives you the quality of cocoa butter. Which cuts down on the use of cocoa butter, one of the most expensive fats in the world. They also discovered that by adding a certain molecule, it eliminates the lengthy and costly process of tempering, which is the repeated heating and cooling of melted chocolate to create its shape. And then those will direct the whole crystallization without going through these very complicated procedures that a chocolatier uh, or a tempering machine does. They don't expect large-scale producers to put all their chocolate eggs in this basket of methods given how much they've already invested in tempering equipment. But even if smaller chocolatiers buy in, it could make for some happier bellies. Very nice. Indeed. And bank accounts. Spencer Turcotte, CTV News, Guelph. After the break, embracing the Canadian cold. The program helping newcomers share in the sport of skiing. Learning to love winter may be one of the toughest challenges for someone who is new to Canada. Let's face it, people have mixed feelings about snow. But there are sports you can do to help enjoy those long winter months. CTV's Miriam Valdez Carletti has more on a ski hill, putting on a special program to help newcomers embrace Canadian culture and the Canadian cold. Good, are you excited? Hi, Fatima. It's a day these kids have been looking forward to for months the chance to glide down the hills at Snow Valley Ski Club. This is something that they probably wouldn't be able to afford on their own, so it's kind of a nice way to just introduce snow activities. The ski club is sponsoring this group of 45 kids with the Alberta Immigrant Women and Children's Centre, giving them the opportunity to ski for the first time and embrace some Canadian culture. We hope that we spark an interest that they could then... Uh, uh, want to try pursuing it a little bit further. The Community Initiatives Program has been putting smiles on newcomers' faces for almost 10 years. As kids prepare to hit the slopes, they first have to gear up and learn the basics. Are you nervous? No, yes. I'm a bit. Of course, I am nervous. I can't even jump properly in these. Uh, they're, they're heavy. Others are more confident. This tutorial is going to be easy. You're just going to pass like it's nothing. The skis are going to carry you down the hill. Whoosh! So you're going to be I good to your skis. Learning how to walk in ski boots and the balance of going fast and slow down the hill. All these skills helping most of these kids speed into their first Canadian winter. A lot of them don't like going outside again when we're at the after school program because it's snowing or they don't know how to play with the snow. After a couple runs on the bunny hill, it turns out skiing is harder, more tiring than it looks. It's fun, but it kind of is like a good exercise. It's kind of like an exercise. It felt my adrenaline was like coming up, but like it was fun at the same time. And while they may not be ready to go down the Black Diamond Hill anytime soon, it's a day these kids won't forget. <laughs> Miriam Valdez Carletti, CTV News, Edmonton. What fun. That's our show for tonight. I'm Heather Butts. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night, and we'll see you again tomorrow.